The Honorable Member for Langley. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, today I'm pleased to have my voice to the debate about uh, C-51, the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2015. That is why we have, um, Mr. Speaker, the international jihadist movement has declared war on Canada. That's why we've tabled this important legislation to stop terrorists dead in their tracks before they can harm law-abiding Canadians. The legislation before us contains a number of provisions that work toward a common goal, protecting Canada and Canadians. It's a broad approach to a global problem that has reached our doorsteps. Today I'll focus my re remarks on important amendments to the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, commonly known as IRPA, specifically Division 9 in the Act. As members of this House know, IRPA sets out the legal framework for Canada's immigration and refugee programs. Our immigration program serves a number of purposes, including enriching the social and cultural fabric of Canada, reuniting families, and strengthening our economy. But the immigration program also plays an, a fundamental role in maintaining the integrity of our borders and safeguarding our national security. In this respect, the government must, must sometimes turn to Division 9 of IRPA, which contains mechanisms that allow the government to use and protect classified information when deciding whether a non-citizen can enter or remain in Canada. Indeed, Division 9 mechanisms and their predecessors have been used for more than three decades. These include security certificates before the federal court and applications for non-disclosure before the Immigration and Refugee Board and the federal court. Certificates commonly, commonly known as security certificates are perhaps the most well-known proceeding under Division 9. Mr. Speaker, briefly, they are used in exceptional circumstances when classified in information is required to establish that a non-citizen is inadmissible to Canada for serious grounds of security, human or international rights violations, serious criminology or organized criminology. Mr. Speaker, the information involved in these cases that we commonly refer to as classified information cannot be dis uh, disclosed publicly because doing so would injure national security or endanger the safety of a person. The certificate is signed by the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness and by the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. It is then referred to the federal court. If the federal court determines the certificate is reasonable, it becomes a removal order that is in a force. The system includes strong safeguards that there is broad judicial discretion to ensure the overall fairness of the proceedings. Further, since 2008, special advocates who are non-governmental lawyers with the required security clearance to handle classified information protect the, inf the interests of non-citizens during the closed portions of the proceedings. In 2014, the Supreme Court of Canada found that the security certificate re regime provides for the fair and constitutional process. Today, we see that the recent phenomena of individuals traveling abroad to engage in terrorist-related activities reinforces the need for Division 9 proceedings. In some of these cases, Division 9 may be the only mechanism available to pursue immigration proceedings against non-citizens so that they are unable to obtain or retain an immigration status, such as a permanent residency, and pursue their removal from Canada. Given the nature of the global threat environment, it is critical that the government be able to rely on effective and fair mechanisms to protect classified information in immigration proceedings before the courts and the Immigration and Refugee Board. We therefore believe that it's important to make limited and targeted changes to Division 9. Recent Division 9 cases have shown that there are times when classified information has become part of a case even when it was irrelevant or repetitive, or not used by the government to prove its allegations. It also did not allow the person subject to the proceedings to be reasonably informed of the case against them. The lack of clarity in Division 9 about what information needs to form part of cases 
has increased the length of time needed to complete these proceedings. This is inconsistent with the legislated obligation to ensure expediency in these cases. Classified information must, must always be handled according to specific procedures, distinct from those uh, used to handle unclassified information. These procedures are meant to protect the classified information and reduce the risk that it be compromised. The current lack of clarity in Division 9 has also resulted in classified information becoming part of the court proceedings, even though it was not used or needed. This is inconsistent with the need to reduce the risk of information being compromised. Further, as it stands now, an appeal or judicial review of an order to publicly disclose classified information can only take place at the end of the proceedings. By the time this appeal could take place, it would be too late as the information could have already been disclosed publicly. This disclosed information then could result in injuring the national security or in endangering people. To avoid releasing information, the government may elect to withdraw from the proceedings the classified information that has been ordered to be publicly disclosed, which could potentially weaken the case. Or the government could also withdraw the allegations against the person, but this is inconsistent with the need to ensure that we pursue all avenues to deny entry and status to individuals who are inadmissible to Canada, especially for serious reasons such as treason. And so that brings me to the amendments found within Bill C-51 designed to address these challenges. First, we will amend Division 9 to clarify what classified information forms part of a security certificate before the federal courts and cases involving classified information before the Immigration and Refugee Board. This would include, in, would include in information that is relevant to the case, that forms the basis of the case, in other words, upon which the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness and the Minister of Citizenship and Immigration rely, and that allows the person to be reasonably informed of the case against them. Relevant information that is not relied upon would also be provided to specific advocates, but this information would not automatically be included as evidence in the case. To ensure fairness, special advocates would have discretion to review this information and determine if some of it should also be included as evidence. This would codify the practice that has evolved over time in Division 9 cases since the Supreme Court's decision on security certificates in 2008. It will help provide more certainty as to how these cases are being conducted, thus reducing the amount of time needed for these cases, making the process more expedient <clears throat> and fair for the person. Mr. Speaker, the regime would also be amended to allow the Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Preparedness and Citizenship and Immigration to ask a judge to be exempted from providing some relevant classified information to the special advocates that is now relied on <clears throat> and which does not reasonably inform the person of the minister's case. To be clear, a judge, <clears throat> a judge would make this decision and would have broad discretion to communicate with special advocates as required. Special advocates could also make submissions to the court as to whether the exemption should be granted. The judge would only grant the exemption if he was satisfied that the information does not enable the person to be reasonably informed in the minister's case. The final measure we're taking is to allow the government to appeal to seek the judicial review of orders to publicly disclose information that it considers injurious to the national security or the safety of all persons during Division 9 proceedings, rather than at the end during instead of at the end. This will provide another opportunity to argue before the court that this information should not be made public. Mr. Speaker, the changes that we are making to protect Canadians are important, and I encourage all members of this House to support C-51. Thank you. Questions and comments? Questioni Kamantai, the Honourable Member for Algoma, Manitoulin, Kepis Casey. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And again, I think we need to reiterate that Canadians don't have to sacrifice security over their rights. It has to be both. So the member um, 
I'm just wondering if he's aware that there's already legislation in place under the Criminal Code, Section 46, that actually takes on all of the concerns that they're actually indicating that they're putting this bill in for. So when we're looking at the fact that the Minister of Public Safety says Canada will not be intimidated, why is it that today we are debating a bill that is actually saying, yes, we are being intimidated. I think that that is just atrocious, Mr. Speaker. So if, we're, if, if the government says that they're investing all of this money, but that's all they're talking about is how much they've actually invested, not how much they spent, because if you look at how much they spent, it certainly isn't the appropriate amount of money that they have actually invested. So on that note, Mr. Speaker, again, it's about security. And it's about the proper tools that are currently in place that can be used. So can the minister, can the minister, can the, the member across tell me, since 2001, how many times has the government resorted to the recognizances with condition provisions that allow police to make preventative arrests? The Honourable Member for Langley. Well, Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for her question, but um, obviously it's been uh, vetted by her party. <clears throat> that uh, unfortunately opposes protecting Canada and Canadians. Mr. Speaker, it is currently not a criminal offence to advocate or promote terrorism. And the NDP wants that to stay. The ability to, re to arrest someone who is, in general terms, advocating and promoting the activity of terrorism does not exist. And the NDP wants that to stay. The threshold for arrest in the criminal code is specific to someone who is knowingly instructs, direct or indirect, any person to carry out terrorist activities. Mr. Speaker, the Anti-Terrorism Act 2015 makes it an offence to advocate or promote terrorism in broader terms. Not everyone who, by communicating statements, knowingly advocates or promotes the commission of terrorism in general, other than an offence under this section, while knowing that any of these offences will be committed or being reckless as to whether any of these offences may be committed as a result of such communication is guilty of an indictable offence and is liable to imprisonment for a term not more than five years. Mr. Speaker, we're trying to protect Canada, we're trying to protect Canadians, and we, have, we are at war with terrorism, Mr. Speaker, and we need to act accordingly. To do nothing, as the NDP uh, suggests, is irresponsible, and it's not what Canadians want, and it's not what Canada needs. Questions and comments. Kestjoin come on side. The Honourable Member for Winnipeg North. Yes, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The security of Canadians and the protection of the rights and freedoms is important to the Liberal Party. It is something in which uh, we have been advocating ever since the government has brought forward uh, this, uh, this legislation, Mr. Speaker. And one of the ways in which the government can best address the concerns that the Liberal Party and through the Liberal Party, I would suggest to you, uh, Canadians as a whole expect of the government is to provide clear oversight. We're calling on the government to recognize the importance of parliamentary oversight. This is something in which whether the USA or England or Australia, they've already done that. The question to the member is, why not Canada? Why not have uh, parliamentary oversight here in Canada in order to ensure uh, rights and freedoms for all Canadians? Good the Honourable Member for Langley. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I <clears throat> I do uh, acknowledge that the, uh, the Liberal member is consistent in believing that uh, security, national security will, will work out, everything will work out, the economy will manage itself, and uh, everybody will live in harmony and love. But that's, Mr. Speaker, not reality. War has been declared against Canada, and we are taking appropriate action by uh, creating a carbon tax by hiring more bureaucracy to manage this, Mr. Speaker, is irresponsible. It will not protect Canadians. What we're doing with this legislation, C-51, needs to be supported by every member in this House. One short question, the Honourable Member for Yukon. I'd like to thank my colleague for his intervention. We heard on the other side the opposition talking about about resources, and of course, in the intervention I made, and maybe my honourable colleague can talk about this, our government has already increased resources available to national security by one-third, and of course, NDP uh, voted against that increase. And would the member comment then, it's not only about resources, but this legislation 
allowing the legislative tools so that we can do more with the resources we have and we're not asking our law enforcement agencies and security, security intelligence services to, to deal with this threat with one hand tied behind their back. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Honourable Member for Langley, you only have about 45 seconds. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and the, the member is quite right, and I want to thank him for serving Canada over the years, uh, not only as a police officer formally, but here as Member of Parliament. We have increased resources, but every time we've done that, the NDP and the Liberals have opposed that, Mr. Speaker. We want a strong and safe Canada, and C-51 will give our, our, our police forces and security and CSIS the tools that they need. Thank you so much.